I think that I would be the perfect candidate for someone to borrow me for about a half an hour. <laughs> it's the Bob, Bob and Sherry Oddcast. The Bob, Bob and Sherry Oddcast. Odd Come on Come in, on you'll have, have a blast, blast with, with the Bob, Bob and Sherry Oddcast. Odd so I read this really interesting uh, article, and it was by Susan Wallace Conlon. And she said, in Denmark, there are libraries where you can, quote, borrow, unquote, a person instead of a book to listen to their life story for 30 minutes. The goal is to fight prejudice in this case. Each person has a title like unemployed or refugee or bipolar. But listening to their story, you realize how much you shouldn't judge a book by its cover. An innovative and brilliant active project that exists in 50 countries now. It's an initiative from something called the Human Library. And there are pictures that I'm looking at of people seemingly in a library, and they're sitting in comfortable chairs across a little table, like a small coffee table, uh, face-to-face talking to each other. Some of them are older, and some of them are fairly young. It's a variety of, of, of persons. So you go into the library, and I guess there are people who have you know, dedicated a certain amount of time of the day to be the person borrowed. And then you tell your story. I think that's fantastic. I think that this is something that's perfect for you. I think I, I think I could do a good job with it. You know, yeah. this is where the jokes usually come in. Uh, let me tell you about marriage. You know, no, no, there, there's no joke there. I think I could talk about um, how to come from a very, um, I hate to use the word poor, but uh, we were flat ass broke for a long time. So let, let's just say not affluent. And get out of that situation. How to deal with being a very young father. How to deal with the loss of a child. How to um, reinvent yourself. Um, how to deal with um, bosses who didn't have your best interests in mind. How to appreciate travel and broaden yourself. And, and how wonderful it is. You know, there are a lot of people that are afraid of it. Um, but it's not just me. I mean, I think you would be fantastic. I think Max, with all of his experience and all of the things that he does for other people, I could see actually Max signing up for this before me. Um, what a wonderful idea. And for someone to walk in and there's someone that's maybe not their race, uh, not of their social um, position, to sit down and talk with someone face to face and to hear what they're all about. That could really, you know, in a small way, for it to do wonders, particularly with uh, how much hatred there is for each other in this country right now, you'd really have to have a major movement in doing this. But every I, little thing helps. And well, I think what a, what a wonderful idea these people came up with. Empathy happens, you know, when you discover that the other person is a person just like you. Right, you right. Know? And that mm-hmm. you've demonized them maybe or made them into some sort of a caricature, but they're just like you. What I one of the things I love about this idea is so many people are resistant to therapy. And, yeah. and they don't they won't go talk to a therapist because there's so much judgment and stigma around mental health in our culture. But mm. they may go, they may be willing to go check out a human and talk to that person. Right? Or maybe the person who doesn't want to go into therapy is the person who's checked out. Possibly, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. One, one of the examples was somebody was bipolar. So, you know, you know you're dealing with that. Um, and someone comes in and says, I would like to check out uh, George over here. Uh, and I see that he's bipolar. I don't know anything about that. So now George, who's been, you know, wrestling with this for probably all his life, has a chance to say, well, this is what it's like. And this is where I, you know, I'm weak and this is where I'm strong and this is where I'm you know, happy and blah, blah, blah. That's like therapy for him. It, well, and what better way do we have to understand a person who's experiencing that um, illness and that diagnosis than from their own 
story in their own right. words, right? Right. I mean, it does, it breaks down the walls that separate us and make us judge each other and fear each other. I really, really like this. I'm just concerned that here in the U.S., if we adopted this, there's always that guy that wants to turn this into an extension of Pornhub and be checking people out for <laughs> other reasons. And that's yeah. disappointing, Brian. That was a very disappointing <laughs> idea you had just now. <laughs> Sit tight. We'll be right back. Do you own or rent your home? Sure you do. And I bet it can be hard work. You know what's easy? Bundling policies with GEICO. GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. And it's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your home. Go to GEICO.com, get a quote, and see how much you you could save. It's Geico easy. Visit Geico.com today. That's Geico.com. It's the Bob and Sherry store sizzling summer sidewalk sale. Everything in stock is on sale. 10% off. 10% off. Including Sherry Lynch's cookbook, Cooking with Cats. And swag you can use like Bob and Sherry 24 ounce latte mugs, travel mugs, H2 go water bottles, and our very hot line of mother of all mothers merch, including tote bags, candles, wear around tea and sleep shirt 10% off it's the sizzling summer sidewalk sale everything is 10% off just hit shop at bobandcherry.com and use the discount code podcast at checkout we are talking about this program that they have in Denmark where you can actually check a person out like the person is a book or a magazine at a library and for 30 minutes you chat with somebody that you don't know that has perhaps a very different life than you have, or someone who's a great deal younger or older than you are. There's so many different ways you could go with this. You know, you could get somebody who's in their 60s or 70s and really set in their ways, and they hear, you know, about what young people are doing today, and, you know, they've, they've, got, they've got an attitude that young people are not f- figuring out how to save, they're not um, working hard enough, whatever the prejudice is. And then the young person says, well, here's my situation. You know, I'm already in $60,000 worth of debt and I'm not what you think. And, and so, you know, you get to maybe know somebody a little bit that way. Um, I, I, I think it will be interesting also. You always, you always say um, that the rich person should uh, check out the, uh, 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 the poor person. So that uh, the rich person can say, this is what I did to, uh, to accomplish something. But I think it would be interesting also that there are, there are poor people or people who are not affluent that think that all you know, wealthy people are assholes. And maybe you would find that not all of them are. Some are, well, and there, obviously, there are, but not all. There are affluent people who think that poor people are poor because they're lazy. And right. they could use an education. That, right. that street runs both. Ways. That's the obvious one. The flip is what I just said. Um, I think if you look back on your own life, like haven't some of the most significant moments in your life happened because another person shared their story with you and you suddenly saw the world, like everything shifted and the world came into focus in a different way? Yes, I would say that that's that is the, the case. Yes, I, I, I'm trying to think if that has happened to me very much. I mean, I I think what made impressions on me um, mostly were just observing people that I admired, and then avoiding doing things with people I didn't admire. I I've had um I've had I've the never had an, I never had a mentor really. Well, I've had the opportunity. People have shared uh, all across my life, even when I was really young. People have shared stories with me, and I and I love that. Like I love when the person next to me on the plane um, tells me something completely unexpected. And some of those stories have stayed with me forever and ever and ever. Some of them were um, funny, and some were very very sad. And some were confusing and mysterious. Um, but it's it's the rare story that I've been told that hasn't left a mark, that's maybe changed the way that I look at things and think about things. And I'm thinking like there's one in particular. So um, it was a guy, he was in his mid-20s, I think he was 26. 
and he had been injured and uh, he was a pedestrian and he was really wasted. He was, he was drunk. He was on drugs. He was absolutely blotto out of his mind. He had a very serious substance problem and he tried to cross a multi-lane interstate at night, wasted out of his mind and he got hit and he survived it. Um, but with significant lifelong um, damage and impairments. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he told me one day um, we were talking and he said to me one day, he said, you know what the worst part of this is? He said, the worst part is people think that because I had a head injury that I don't know what my life is and what I did to myself. I had a head injury, but I still know what my life is and what I did to myself. And every day I have to wake up and tell myself not to be better. Yeah. 26 years old. Wow. That stayed wow. with, of course that stayed with me. How does that not stay mm -hmm. with you? When right. I was a freshman at temple, I was at a bar in Philly. It was 25 cent draft night. So me and my friends were there with all the other uh, students and a bunch of longshoremen right off the docks in Philly. And I met a guy there who um, was a quadriplegic. He was a competitive diver in high school and he was goofing around at a friend's house and dove into the shallow end of a pool mm. and talked to me. And we talked for a long time about um, what the accident and what had happened and what his, uh, what his life was like now and what he was going for um, with his life now. And I never forgot that night, never forgot him. I think that people's stories are the only real doorways into human empathy and understanding other people. I just don't think there's any other yeah. way. It would be interesting given where we are right now in the United States to uh, have someone who is very pro mask, very pro um, cleaning up the environment. You know, the type of person that I'm talking to about have him sit down opposite someone who just says, we're here to um, enjoy life. I don't believe that, you know, th there's anything to global warming. And um, these are my reasons. If those two people could talk without becoming angry at each other, you know, I think that would be a very cool thing. The problem is for any kind of major change in this country, you'd have to have millions of people doing it. And that is really unlikely because when you, when you hear that there are people that are saying, if you believe in this, I don't, I don't, I not only don't want to talk to you, I wish you would die. I literally wish you would die. Like, like the asshole who called the, uh, the police officer who defended the Capitol and just said these horrible things, these threatening things to him, you know, I, I don't you're never going to get through a, a prick like that. I don't understand like how we've gotten to this point where we can't um, it's forget common ground. We should have ample common ground. We're humans. Um, we're sharing this life together. We're citizens of this city, state country, whatever. Um, we're all children of God. Like we, we should have ample common ground where we can meet each other. I don't know how we've gotten to the point where we just can't listen to anybody else's story and understand how anybody else got where they got, how they got to the point of making the choices and decisions. Yeah. That well, that's, made. that's what, we that's what you're it. supposed to do with this sort of thing. I know, you know, it'd be really cool if certain well-known people would make themselves available at the libraries. Like I could go in and check out, Oh, I don't know. Kate Beckinsale for about a half an hour. Hey, Kate, I, well, tell me. And then she knows it's only a half an hour. So, you know, she's not skeezing me too much. I think if famous people were available to be checked out, I think everybody would be checking out um, Chris Hemsworth and Tom Hanks and nobody would, but wait, and nobody, nobody would check out Ben Perkins, who's the third generation to run a, a hardware store in this small town. Right. Nobody yeah. would be interested in his story. I know. And I, and I think part of, part of how we got to where we are is because we're so fixated on cartoony things you know, mm -hmm. Hollywood dramas and superheroes and athletes and bullshit that we're not interested in the stories of regular people 
And that's why I don't think we should be able to check Chris Hemsworth out. Also because I would eventually get a re- have a restraining order on me. <laughs> it would be really cool, though, wouldn't it, to sit down with somebody like Warren Buffett or uh, George Clooney or who, who would be another one? I was going to say um, Bill Gates, but maybe not right now. Um, <laughs> you know, I, but what you say, Sherry, is that, that ordinary people have a story to tell. There's a, um, I go to a nail salon, and I'm not afraid to say that I'd go to a nail salon. But I do, and it's run by uh, people who are primarily from Vietnam. And there was a man in there one day who was Vietnamese, and he was like the husband of one of the women that was working there, and he's playing the guitar. And I asked him a little bit about it, and he said, I learned how to do it when I was in prison. And he said, but not in this country. He was in prison in Vietnam. Oh, wow. And um, he went on to talk about what his experience was like there because I was asking questions. And you want to talk about somebody who has gone through and had a fascinating story who broadened my view of the world just through a simple conversation. I think there are a yeah. lot of people that do that. Just if you just if you are willing to sit and listen, if you ask people how they are, they'll tell you, do you know, what? I, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you give me a lot of grief because I once had a busboy from a sushi restaurant. I, he didn't have a place to stay and I invited him to come stay at my house and he came and lived with me for a few months. And you give, and I was married at the time, so it wasn't like it was some hot and romantic hookup. You give me grief about that, like, oh, I just take in every stray. But I got to talking with this guy at the sushi restaurant, and his his father was a very prominent, successful businessman in Okin. I want to say Okinawa, maybe, and um, expected his son to follow completely in his footsteps, and his son didn't want any of it. He wanted to come to the United States and go to college. He wanted to travel. He wanted to play music. He wanted to, he just wanted a different life. And it was impossible for him to, to follow any of his own dreams, living in his father's house, in his father's city, surrounded by his father's influence. So he said to his father, I'm going to America. And his father was like, not on my dime. And so he came here and enrolled in college and was working his way and was between um, uh, roommate situations and sleeping in his car when I came across him. And I just thought like, what a story, like, look at you. A lot of us have dreams and we want to follow them, but our parents say, Nope, you can't do that. And we go, Oh, okay. And then we're fucking bitter until mm-hmm. the day we die and when people say well why didn't you ever chase your dream well my father told me i had to be an electrical engineer or a nurse or whatever this guy this guy d- defied everything that he was yeah. told and came to the u.s and chased his dream did he eventually go back home to japan yeah eventually he did but as he put it he said when i do go back home it'll be because i'm ready to go back home and show my father that I'm a man and yeah. that I'm going to live this life. So I, I have zero interest in talking to Jennifer Aniston. I've seen inside the actor's studio, zero interest in talking to George Clooney. I, I know what that's all about. Those people are, their whole lives and essences are packaged and sold to us as commodities. What, what do they have to say to you? People would, it would just be, entertainment tonight but at the library i don't think that famous people know. should be allowed to check themselves out i i, I think that you know I, well i just threw that out there for the for the hell of it but I, I think some of the people who are very famous whether it's in entertainment or business or whatever uh have interesting things to say very often they're thoughtful uh very often they express themselves um easily but not just them. I mean, I just threw that in there to be funny. Studs Terkel is a famous writer. He's no longer with us who wrote, um, he did interviews with average Americans who have done, he used to say, I talk to average Americans who have done above average things. And uh, it might be a taxi cab driver in Chicago who also is studying to be a violinist and wants to appear, you know, with a uh, national orchestra. Those are the type of things that I think are interesting, but I don't think we can dismiss every celebrity because some of them are fascinating people. No, it's not their fault that we've created a culture where we worship that 
right? You can't tell mm -hmm. me that if your local library had 25 citizens to check out and one of them was Bruno Mars, you can't tell me the lines wouldn't be around the block for selfies with Bruno Mars. No, that's true. That's very true. I mean, this is this is like a fantasy thing. Maybe maybe it's one of these deals where they just drop in out of the blue, and maybe you get lucky that day when you're going through the library. When we were out in um, Utah a couple weeks ago, I said to my daughter and my niece, "Listen, this is your grandmother, and she's not going to be here forever. Although she may be because she's an alien hybrid living in the <laughs> desert where the, the heat is preserving her, but this is your grandmother, nice and in theory, and in theory, she's not going to be here forever. The only way you're going to learn about your family and where you come from is by asking questions." You're not at some point, like 20 years from now, going to be able to Google who am I and get an answer. And yeah, you can do 23andMe and you can do Ancestry.com and you'll get a treasure trove of facts and figures and data. But the stories of your family and the stories of how your family came to be and ultimately the stories of how you came to be. Those, oh, I would give anything to do those that aren't with, at websites. With, with my relatives. You know, I make fun of, you know... The, Shay Shay, my grandmother. I would, I really would love to have, you know, said, what was it like growing up, uh, bringing up those boys and girls during the depression? You know, what, what struggles, what were the toughest struggles? The problem is that some people don't communicate easily. You know, they're embarrassed. There's a tape recorder rolling or there's a person looking at them and it's considered too vain to talk about yourself, at least from that generation. I would have loved to, have, you know, sat down with my uncle George, who I barely knew. And asked about, you know, did you ever see my father? Were you both, you both were in the war together? Did you ever, you know, meet up together? He never talks about you. But somebody has to jump out there and do it. I'm surprised that my own girls have not done that with me. I'm surprised too. I think maybe they, they think they know everything. I, I, that's mm -hmm. all I can guess because they, your life, you talk so much about your own life and maybe they think they've heard every story. Yeah, like, that's possible. I, Sometimes my girls will say to me, wait, you're just now telling me that? Well, you're mm -hmm. just now interested or you're just now mm -hmm. old enough to hear it. Or I, you know, I can't follow you around all day long telling you stuff. <laughs> like it just, it has to come up when it comes up. I think it's also more difficult when you have a family that uh, has gone through a divorce. I, mean, I, think it's, I think it's easier to talk to your kids about, well, <clears throat> I came up this way when I was a child. I went to school there. I got a job there. Uh, it was very difficult here. I met your mother there. We had you here. You know, but, but when, it's, when, when you've divorced uh, their mother, she's divorced you, it's, it's a little bit different. I don't know that they really embrace, well, I dated so-and-so after your mother and I broke up and she was a ballerina and, and this lady was the best real estate salesperson in town. You know, it's harder for them to hear that. Yeah, but the, that, stories that is of still, your, yeah. the stories of your early life, you know, yeah, those yeah. are the stories like they... They don't have any idea. You think that your kids are paying so much attention to you, and they are, but not in the ways that you think. They're paying attention to all of your hypocrisies, and I don't mean you in specific. I mean all of us. Your kids watch you like a hawk to notice every inconsistency, every hypocrisy, every flaw, every fault, but they're not paying attention to all of the millions of little moments that made you you because to them, we are mom and dad. And we're not right. really people, right. you know, in that way. They, they almost can't bear for us to be people because then we would be imperfect and mortal and not around forever. So they're not, they don't even know what questions to ask, you know? Like, well, I just, I just, uh, wrapping this up, I just want to say that I, I think that, uh, where was it, Denmark? I've even forgotten that, uh, who came up with this idea. Uh, it's brilliant. And I hope that happens in some way, shape or form. In the United States, I think it would be well, a great thing. It could start happening right now. Every single person that is listening to this episode could find a moment in the next week to uh, learn part of somebody else's story. Yeah. Whether it's the person checking you out at the grocery store or your neighbor, or maybe you've never really asked um, even your best friend something about their lives that you don't already know. 
You know, maybe there are people really close to you all around you who have a story to tell that you can't even imagine. Mm -hmm. You can start there. Mm -hmm. You're right. So, folks, if it sounds good to you, start it. You could start in a very easy way with somebody in your family. Thank you for listening. New episodes of the Oddcast every single Monday and Friday. Our website is B-O-B-A-N-D-S-H-E-R-I.com. You can drop us a line there. You can rate and review the Oddcast. That helps us get the word out and keep it going. And if you have something to share and would like to be on the Oddcast, you can download our app. It's free in Google Play in the Apple Store. Tap the mic and send us a talkback message or DM us on the socials or shoot us an email at bobandsherry.com. Y'all stay safe and healthy and be decent to one another. And we'll see you next time on the Oddcast. Hey, thank you so much for listening to the Bob and Sherry podcast and the Bob and Sherry Oddcast. We would love if you would subscribe, rate and review and share it with a friend on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, wherever you go. And thank you again for listening.